Tonight we begin with what could be a long series of interviews with candidates in next year's city election. Our guest is the second candidate so far to announce a campaign for mayor. She's a former city council president and still the counselor for a district that includes parts of Mattapan and Dorchester. We'd like to welcome Andrea Campbell. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Counselor. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. Councilor, I want to start with what might be a sort of a keynote of your campaign, and you're saying that you're running because you want to give people a change and a chance. Uh, what does that mean exactly? So I think, you know, we are in a unique moment in this country as well as this city where we are talking about race and racism and systemic inequities. And I think this is a unique moment and opportunity for the city of Boston to address its own painful history with respect to race and racism and to recognize that inequities in every system you can imagine still exist. But I also think it's time for new leadership, right? So I am jumping into this race uh, to be the next mayor of the city of Boston to confront that painful history, to eradicate inequities we've been talking about for far too long, and most importantly, to do it in such a way that it brings folks together across every neighborhood in the city of Boston to be a part of the solutions. Well, uh, working on solutions, one thing that you worked on as a counselor was introducing body cameras to be worn by police. And I know that has some ways to go still. Um, what does that say about what you could be doing if you were to mayor? So body cameras, right, was one of my first uh, initiatives on the council as chair of public safety. And that was an initiative that was uh, spearheaded by folks in the community and advocates on the ground, including uh, BPCAT. And we're continuing to have conversations about how we get body cameras on every officer in our department years later. And so I think we are talking about police reform given what's happening across the country, but also the fact that certain neighborhoods in the city of Boston tend to be over-policed. We just saw the recent data for FIO or stop and frisk data that suggests that 70% of the police stops are of black residents, even though they are only a quarter of the population. And that over-policing and disparities has only, only gone up. And so this is an opportunity for us to address that head on, to push for greater transparency and accountability in our police department. Body cameras is one piece of that, but we need more action uh, from the administration with respect to every policing reform initiative that's on the table. And there are I many. Yeah. Now, I, I know that you also want to see more independent review of complaints uh, against the police, but I want to talk about a couple of the funding issues, because on the one hand, there have been some very serious questions raised about police overtime, but police have also been criticized in this town for not doing enough legwork on non-fatal shootings. They don't have a very good clearance rate. So how do you square those two things? So I think, you know, over time, we're talking about a budget that is over $70 million. And um, as many of my council colleagues have recognized, if you're running any business, that's not an efficient or effective way of running a business when you think about our overtime numbers and hours. So how do we reimagine our police department structure in such a way that every neighborhood has the coverage they need in order for, you know, when they call 911, for there not to be a long delay in actually having an officer show up and respond. And I think there's changes we could be making structurally. I've talked to many police officers who have great ideas on how to do that. There are also ways to reduce that overtime budget um, so that the resources are redirected to programs and initiatives that address the root causes of violence, including mental health, trauma, things for our young people, those who are getting out of prison, right, so they don't continue the cycle of violence. And of course, those resources could be re redirected to unsolved murders, which tend to be higher um, in terms of in, in communities of color. And it was just on a call with Mary Franklin who has spearheaded this issue for a really long time after losing her husband. I was on the call along with other folks from the administration, including the mayor, talking about how we support some of her initiatives, including her trauma spa, which gets at the root causes of violence and addresses mental health and trauma, but also how we redirect some of those funds to help uh, heal a community, particularly those who have suffered a loss and are still waiting for accountability, which I know far too well personally, given my own personal story with respect to loss. Uh, you're also interested in equity for the Boston Public Schools. How would you like to see that increased? So this is an issue that's near and dear to me. You know, as a former Boston Public Schools kid, I went to five BPS schools from pre-K all the way through the 12th grade. And I got into this work of being elected after losing my twin brother, Andre, who cycled in and out of the criminal justice system, passes away while in the custody of the Department of Correction when he was 29. 
So instead of going through BPS and re realizing his god given potential, what I realized is that system failed him and it continues to fail many. And so I put out plans, specific action plans with specific ways in which the district could ex immediately expand access to the number of quality seats available to our families. If you live in downtown neighborhoods, you have an 80% chance of getting into a high quality Boston public school. If you live in Mattapan, like I do with my two boys, it's 5%. In that plan, we talked about expanding access to early education. It's critically important that we focus on K0 to three or, or birth to five, right? That's the framing in the report because we know that foundation is critical for every young person to be successful in the later years. And also how we, sort of take power away from the district and give it to our families and our school leaders on the ground level. There's just a sentiment, and I think this is continuing as we talk about remote learning and the lack of uh, planning in partnership, where folks on the ground just feel like plans are coming out of the district, they're being asked to adhere to them without an opportunity to offer any input. And so our, my action plans, have often spoke about shifting that paradigm where the families, the students, and the educators um, not only are included in the conversation, but also are given the space to create plans and the district sort of needs to get out of the way a little bit. Uh, I know that uh, you have raised complaints before about schools serving the most vulnerable students who were having their budgets cut, but four years ago, you supported lifting the cap on charter school expansion. And certainly there are some people out there who took you to task for that, saying that was part of the problem. What do you say to them? No, absolutely. And so I said, if I represented a different district, my perspective on that issue might've been different. You know, I represent largely Dorchester and Mattapan, a little bit of Jamaica Plain and Rosendale, where the inequities in our school system are alive and well. I just spoke to that. The lack of access to a quality Boston public school a seat and is real for families in my district. Many families have their child in a BPS school, a charter school, parochial school. But the reason I um, showed up in that space towards the end of that campaign was I was frustrated with the us versus them uh, framework. You know, you're for BPS, you're against charter schools, you're for charter, you're against BPS. Our families, that's not what they're saying. They're saying, I want a high quality school and a good education for my family and my child. And what is the best option? Every family wants to go to Boston public schools like I did. But they're realizing when they go through the process, which is often cumbersome, they don't always come out on the other side with an excellent Boston public school. And so then they're looking to go elsewhere. So my immediate focus is how do we improve the Boston public school system in such a way that my families don't look to go elsewhere, that they have a choice right here within our system. But the reality is that is not the reality today. And so we have families in charter schools, um, but my focus right now in the immediate is improving our Boston public schools. And I've put out action plans and now I hope that they will be adopted. And in this run for mayor, I look forward to going into every single neighborhood outside of District 4 to talk about the critical issues of education in the city of Boston. Uh, what do you see as far as a change of direction in housing? What would you like to see? Oh, there's so much. And so one, housing we know is an opportunity to close the racial wealth gap that exists in the city of Boston. Right now you have a black family with a median wealth of $8. Some Latinx families, it's $0. A white family, it's nearly $250,000. So we've done a lot with respect to pushing for the creation of home ownership in particular. Um, my first piece of legislation on the council was the Community Preservation Act. I took a lot of heat because people thought, you're taxing me, you just got there. And I said, no, this is a mechanism to create greater affordable housing, home ownership opportunities, green space, historic preservation. But there's a lot more we need to do in the midst of this pandemic to keep people in their homes, keep our renters safe, to make housing more affordable in the city of Boston. So a lot of ideas on that um, and, and more creative ideas. There are ideas that can come from government but some of the community-based solutions, including activating our vacant lots in the city, are ways in which to create more homeownership opportunities and close the racial wealth gap all at the same time. Well, next year, and I don't have a crystal ball, uh, this could be a race for an open seat, but if not, um, I wonder, is it gonna be more like uh, Tito Jackson versus uh, Marty Walsh three years ago, or is it gonna be more like Ayanna Presley versus Mike Capuano. I mean, what did you see looking ahead when you got into this race? 
Well, I first want to say, you know, uh, Congresswoman Presley and, and former Councilor Jackson, they're, they are stressing the same points, you know, that folks in the city of Boston are frustrated and upset because they don't want to keep talking about the same inequities inequities in housing, inequity, inequities in access to a good education, good jobs, good health care. And all of this, of course, is borne by communities of color for the most part. The pandemic is the deadliest in communities of color. Um, and so right now, this campaign is saying, we don't want to just talk about the inequities. I don't want to just talk about the inequities. We've done some creative things in the district to respond, but now we need leadership that is going to be extremely intentional about those inequities and eradicating them who understands them, who has lived them. I've lived many of those inequities growing up in the city of Boston and of course as a BPS kid. And so for me, this is the moment in time to say we're, we want to eradicate these inequities, transform systems that perpetuate them so that every single resident in the city of Boston, regardless of where they live, their race, their ethnicity, their immigration status, has the same opportunity like anyone else in the city of Boston. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again. City Councilor Andrea Campbell, candidate for Mayor of Boston. We'll have more news in just a moment.